The Gateway brings you the day's news from the St. Louis region and across Missouri. It also includes stories from the Illinois side of the river and our Metro East reporter, Will Bauer. In Alton, in Belleville, in East St. Louis, in Edwardsville, in Cahokia Heights, at Scott Air Force Base, I'm Will Bauer, St. Louis Public Radio. Listen to reports from Will and all of our journalists weekdays on The Gateway, on the STLPR app, and wherever you get podcasts. Former State Representative Vicki England is a veteran of South St. Louis County's political scene, and now she's trying to get back to the Missouri General Assembly by facing up against a familiar foe. England joins us next on another edition of Politically Speaking. Nine, eight, eight seven, six, six five, five, five-ish, four, three, two, one. one. Uh, I think that is fair As to I say. say hands to kiss and babies to shake. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think my record speaks for itself. That's a really good question. Hello and welcome to the Politically Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Rosenbaum, a reporter with St. Louis Public Radio. Joining me in the studio today is... Joe Manis, also from St. Louis Public Radio. And our very, 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 very special guest today... Vicki Englund. I think I'm using extra varies because of the reasons we're doing this podcast today. Yes, yes. Uh, Ms. Englund, former state rep from South County, who had been uh, the the announced Democratic candidate for the first district state Senate race. Um, Things have changed. Most of our listeners have already heard Scott Sifton, who's the incumbent, who's now decided to seek re-election. So the the great podcast that we had recorded with um, former Representative England had to be redone. And so we are now featuring Representative England again as she uh, seeks to win back her seat. And we will also have, right after this for our listeners, a uh, podcast with Gloria Brown, the Republican incumbent for that seat. And when when Joe says redone, we're we're talking about making it even better than it was before. And so. it, and it was a good podcast. Because well, you can save that for 2020, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, it was really a good podcast. <laughs> yeah, 2020. Um, so just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, where you grew up, where you went to high school, and what you did at the high school that makes you. <laughs> I think, so special in the Missouri political world. Sure. Well, I bo- was born and raised in South County. I went to St. Catherine Library Grade School and Lindbergh High School, so uh, Lindbergh Flyers, class of 92. And what you're alluding to is what we talked about before, which was, um, you know, I tried out for cheerleading. I was not good at cheerleading. Um, it just wasn't my thing. But I was actually the mascot. So Lynn Bird uh, was the mascot in the late 80s, early 90s when I was in high school, and I was Lynn Bird. It's just, a, it's just an amazing revelation we have here. And it's it's not a really a revelation to us, but I think it should be a revelation to all the Missouri yeah, world. Yeah, so what sort of things did, the, did you have to do as Lynn Bird? Did you do cartwheels and stuff like that? Well, if my bird head had been attached to my bird body, I would have loved to have done cartwheels. But since the head would come detached anytime I tried to go upside down, we mostly were just jumping and cheering like a cheerleader, running around on the field, the football field, football games, basketball games, just kind of being crazy. And no one actually knew it was me. So I'm actually, you Was know, it hot in there? Uh, hot is an understatement. Um, there's this was back in the day, right? No air conditioned suits. Um, your hair kind of ended up being a nest at the end of the day, and you really couldn't see where you were going very much. But it was great. I had a lot of fun, a lot of school spirit for the Flyers. And um, just as a, a shout out in the Missouri political world, my fraternity brother, Brian Milner, who now works for the University of Missouri, a former lobbyist, was Truman the Tiger. And I was blessed to be able to wear the Truman head in college because of that. So I guess I have a fondness for people who used to be <laughs> And Brian mascots. is a great friend of mine, too. And um, those those uniforms, uh, if someone could invent a way to clean them more thoroughly, we would all appreciate it. <laughs> so after you were done being uh, the greatest mascot in South County history, I, 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 I know that you went to Washington, D.C. for college and mm-hmm. I guess the first part of your career. Tell us a little bit about that and how it influenced your, your political thinking going forward. Sure. So being the class of 92, as a lot of people um, who were around then would recall, 92 was an excellent, excellent political year. You know, year I Bill started, Clinton won. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I started American University in the fall of 92. Um, that was before the election. So I volunteered on Clinton Gore. And I was really excited as a Midwesterner to see another Midwesterner come to D.C. You know, it's a different kind of mentality than those East Coast and West Coast people. I know. Um, and so to be in D.C. during that time frame was an amazing thing. And I think it really did cement my interest in politics. And um, I majored in political science and got my bachelor's and master's there and interned for Dick Gebhardt first semester. 
I did an internship abroad also, so I really learned a lot from my experience. I think there. you had to bite your tongue before calling East Coast people like East Coast elitist or the lamestream East Coasters or something well, like I'll that. Well, I'll call them that because <laughs> I was in the Washington Bureau of the Post-Dispatch in the early 80s. I can tell you. So, it's true. But after that, you came back to St. Louis County. I, I, I believe you worked for the St. Louis County Economic Development Council. That's that correct, name? in 2001. Yeah. And um, you almost ran for the St. Louis County Council seat that was eventually won in 2008 by uh, 2004 yeah you and this was 2004 mm-hmm. against John Campisi the councilman in South County you decided against running for that seat the Democrat lost that year but had you won you would have been the council woman instead of councilman Steve Stanger who won that four years later So who knows you might be the county executive now well you know let's let's not jump to too many conclusions <laughs> however uh, you know good things happen to those who wait um, it was not my time. I had to be convinced it wasn't my time back in the early days. And, uh, you know, I, I understood back then that uh, as Democrats, we need to do more to build our party and not not separate our because party. Because I always I mention that because had uh, the stars aligned differently, uh, Steve Stanger would still be the Cottleville prosecutor as opposed to <laughs> the St. Louis County executive. I know I've made that joke before. I do but apologize I, to Cottleville for taking him away. I just think it's funny memory. to make fun of him as much as we can. But um <laughs> But not this week. No, not this week. Um, but then in 2008, you ran for the first time as a, a competitive state representative race um, that was open when Senator Jim Lemke, actually State Representative Jim Lemke, decided to run for the state Senate. And um, I guess that'll kind of be the jumping off point to what we talk about next, because you defeated Gloria Brown in 2008. You lost her in 2010. You lost. You beat her in 2012. You lost to her in 2014. And, and now be, there's a rematch. And because of a, a strange turn of events, it looks like you'll be running against each other again. So just tell us a little bit about what's it been like to run in this district and your plans for 2016. Well, while I had not anticipated running a house race this cycle, I am happy to do so. You know, um, Corey and I have obviously known each other from a uh, partisan perspective, but we also know each other from a personal perspective. And we know that at the end of the day, we both have the same goal in mind, which is to represent the people of South St. Louis County to the best of our ability. Um, Now, the way we go about doing that is completely different. You know, we differ on a lot of things. um, And our political parties also differ in a lot of ways. So I think what I've gained over my experience so far is how to really listen to people, how to listen to what the community wants. Um, Clearly, we have a a swing district in South County. We have a huge turnout during presidential years and a low turnout during non-presidential years. So if we go by uh, the Magic 8 ball or the Crystal Ball that we have in South County, it would be my turn to win in 16, and I'm going to work hard to make sure that happens. Now, um, can you say a little bit about the whole... You had been a candidate for the state Senate in the 1st District. Is there anything you want to say about that and the turn of events that ended up with incumbent Scott Sifton deciding instead to run for re-election? Sure, absolutely. I mean, you know, politics is one of those things that um, we all run for office individually, you know. However, at the end of the day, it really is a team sport. You know, we are part of a team. And if we're able to put aside what our personal goals and personal ambitions are and really take one for the team and work hard for the team, at the end of the day, it makes our team stronger. And I think you'll see that in specifically in the Missouri legislature, we need a much stronger Democratic team. We don't need to be having Democrats run against Democrats. In South County, there aren't enough Democrats to run against each other. So we really have to take a much more strategic approach. And at the, we want to work together. I mean, there are so many other things that divide us in Jefferson City. We don't need to be divided amongst our de- Democratic Party. And so that was one of the reasons I decided not to primary Senator Sifton, but to work instead to take back my House seat. We actually have a clip from Senator Sifton. I asked him um, whether, you know, the, the question was a little awkwardly phrased, but the question was basically by deciding to run for reelection. He was essentially blocking your potential advancement into the legislature. And I was wondering if that gate, he put any thought about that prospect before he made his decision to abandon his attorney general run. This was his response. Vicki and I are very close. And what I would say is that there is, um, yeah, we're good. We're good. Uh, she has enthusiasm to return to the House. Uh, that is a seat that the last two presidential cycles she has won. I expect that she will win it again. Uh, and I believe that she has a very bright future in in public service in South County. 
I, I just saw in the Missouri Ethics Commission that Senator Sipton has given you, I think, $5,001. So I think that he's in, in, in South County, that gets a lot of flyers, a lot of mailers, a lot of boots on the ground. So not only is he being, you know, saying kind words about you, it looks like he's going to try to help win this seat back for the Democrats as well. So any summation of kind of what your relationship is right now? Is it is it pretty good, as, as Senator Sifton said? Absolutely. You know, Scott and I have known each other, as he said on that interview, for a long time. And we know that the 94th district is almost completely within the first senatorial district. So even though we'll be on different levels of the playing field, we'll still be working together toward a common goal. So yeah, we're good. Now, there's another aspect of your political career, which is rather interesting. You're one of the few um, members of the legislature who also have another elective post. And there's only a few elective posts that they can do that with. And one of them is for the um, school board. Now, you're not currently in the legislature, but the point is you could be. So you want to talk a bit about the fact that you are on the Lindbergh School Board? Sure. I was first elected to the Lindbergh School Board in 2011 uh, while I was, as I like to say, on sabbatical from, from the House. Um, I was reelected to the House while I was a sitting school board member. So yes, I um, tend to wear a couple hats uh, when it comes to political service and public service. Um, you know, as a school board member, I really care about kids, as all school board members should. I mean, my two children attend Lindbergh schools. I attended Lindbergh High School. And so it's really a strong community that we need strong voices and people who really care and know how to work through the system in order to do what's best for kids. So I enjoy that part. And and as an added benefit uh, that I don't think I had really anticipated until I was reelected to the legislature in 12 was... Um, I started serving on the House Elementary and Secondary Education Committee. And so by serving on that committee, I got to see another perspective, what life was like when we were trying to legislate um, when it comes to education, but also what the school board then has to react to how the legislature is passing bills. So having that combined experience allows me to have a louder voice for Lindbergh and Jefferson City, but it also allows me to try to work toward better public policy because I understand it from that perspective. Now, before we shift into the transfer bill, because that was something that you were deeply involved in in 2014, I just have to ask, since you and Gloria Brown are likely going to be running against each other for the fifth time, is it like boring to run against (laughs) each other? Is it just kind of like, okay, we're running against each other for the fifth straight election cycle? And I'm going to ask this to her as well, but what is it? It seems like it's kind of an unusual situation. Well, maybe the only situation in the state that's like this, where you've had a rematch for the fifth time. Sure. We were probably the only rematch for the fourth time also, but the fifth time, I guess, maybe is special. You know, part of it is boring. I mean, but part of it is predictable. You know, I think we both have a good idea of what we are as candidates. We have a good idea of what our party historically has done to support us. Um, you know, it. uh There are still things that pop up here and again that, uh, from a negative campaign standpoint, are disappointing. That happens um, when we run against each other. Um, So, you know, there are a lot of things in politics that are unpredictable, as we've already talked about. And being able to know a little bit more about who you're running against is, is, I think, a good thing. Yeah, I think the worst part about it is every two years you get a call from me asking, what's it like to run against Gloria Brown? <laughs> well, and I hope the like? voters aren't bored. We no. want the voters to participate. But I think it's, but I mean, as, as, as someone who lives in a non-competitive state representative district, Michelle Crack East District, I think it might be good for the voters that they have competitive elections there every year because the people that are representing them have to fight for their vote and convince them that they should should go. So I think that is a benefit for Republican, Democrats, anybody. Now, from your perspective, what do you see as the biggest differences between you and Representative Brown? I think the number one difference between us has to be the right to work issue. You know, I've stood with working families my entire career. I have a 100 percent pro-union voting record, um, and Representative Brown does not. I mean, if for no other reason alone, you know, my father was a machinist, and it's something that I really value, and I think that the members of the, the residents of the 94th District in South County understand that we need to have good quality jobs for for everyone. How big of an issue is this in your district? I mean, do you have a lot of union members? I mean, just kind of give a a perspective. Absolutely. I think I when I talk to the different unions, I'm told that uh, that the 94th district has probably more retired union households and active union members in it than possibly any other district. I mean, I don't know that for a fact, but what I've been told over the years is that. And I'll tell you, when I'm out knocking on doors, I cannot tell you how many people that's the very first thing out of their mouths. Really? Absolutely. Whether it's not necessarily that that particular, I mean, sometimes, most of the time, 
it's the person who lives and who's answering that door that is either the wife of a union person or the husband of a union person or the union person themselves or retired. But it'll oftentimes be a family member of someone who was in a union or still is in a union. And I get that question all the time in South County. It's a very big deal for, for South County. And it could be a situation because if, if the matchup between Sifton and State Representative Marsha Hafner, a Republican from Oakville, stays the same, you're going to have two candidates with diametrically opposed views on right to work. And you could see a lot of money flow in from unions and from pro right to work uh, advocates. And since, as you mentioned, your district is in the first district, it, it could become a big issue in your race as well. I mean, as far as fundraising and and people running ads over which you would have no control, but I mean, from both sides. Absolutely. I mean, is there a concern about that at all, about whether or not if 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 there's enough right to work forces on both sides that come into the district, in part because of the Senate district, but it would affect your race as well, whether you would have a trickle down effect where you would be difficult to control the message if you've got all these independent groups that are just, and the same would be true for Gloria Brown, well, that, are, that are coming in, have a message, and it may or may not coincide with yours. Well, what I think the most important thing about this has to do with what do the people of the 94th District want? You know, I know there's a lot of information that's out there on the pro-right-to-work side and that there was a letter signed by over 50 organizations. The majority, I think it was 55 organizations and maybe 52 of them were from out of state. So to me, if you have an issue and money being spent in a district and that money is coming from other people than the people who live inside the district, that really says a lot about that issue. And and my goal is to do what the people in the 94th district want. And they're telling me they don't want right to work because it's wrong from Missouri. Well, when did that letter go out and, and who got it? Um, it, it? From what I understand, it has to, it's part of the whole veto session, um, the whole veto session posture. Yeah, and it's not specific to the 94th district. The, the other thing that's floating around is I think that's proponents of right to work are floating out the idea that unions are kind of going hand in hand with Planned Parenthood yeah, to try to get that's the latest. to try to get socially conservative Republicans who are pro anti right to work to flip sides. I think that's specifically targeted like someone like Paul Wheeland or Gary Romine, but it could be targeted at people in the House because there are probably a lot of people in like Republicans who are socially conservative but aren't fans of right to work. I'm sure you've heard about that and well, I, I, you guys have been doing radio a lot longer than I have. I don't know how to project an eye roll um, during the podcast, <laughs> but I had a huge eye roll just now because, yeah. come on, let you know, this is not what normal people talk about. They yeah. don't sit there and talk about some kind of conspiracy theory or how the unions or what they have to do. People are concerned in South County about jobs, whether they have them, whether they lost them, whether they're underemployed or unemployed. That's what people want to talk about. All the other stuff is just political rhetoric that um, I hope we're able to cut through. It is difficult in a highly competitive race to keep those other messages and other money from coming in and trying to mess around with what real people think about in their real lives every day. I wish there was an eye roll sound effect. It'd be like, <laughs> something <laughs> like Jason's that. Jason's doing right now. <laughs> now, d- just for real, real short, for our listeners, uh, what the accusation is based on is some comments by Richard Trumka, who's head of the AFL-CIO, who was just su- in praise of Planned Parenthood's work on women's health. And that's how this got started. Yeah. Then then the uh, uh, the critics of Planned Parenthood have immediately contended that there's some sort of uh, conspiracy. Traditionally, the AFL-CIO has tried to stay out of the social issues because they have People on both sides, not just on abortion, but right. especially on gun rights mm-hmm. and some other things. Yeah, if you meet just an everyday union person, you, um, a lot of them are opposed to abortion and in favor of gun rights. And some may not be, but it, it's a pretty diverse lot. Continue, Joe. Yeah, okay. So now the other issue, though, it, in your race and and that's on the minds of a lot of people going into veto session is the trans, the school transfer bill and uh, just how education is going to play out. I'd be interested in your take on all this because you were in the General Assembly during the first, the passage of the first transfer bill, correct? That's correct. Which was vetoed by the governor. And then there was a second one, which has also been vetoed by the governor. You want to talk about this? Well, I'm definitely more knowledgeable on the 2014 bill. I did sit on the conference committee and work very hard um, across the aisle to try to come up with a solution to the transfer problem. And I think what happened with the 2014 bill is it became like a lot of other bills do in Jefferson City, uh, like a Christmas tree. Every little education issue was added to one big bill. And 
as oftentimes happens as a legislator, I really wish we had a button on our desks that wasn't just yes or no, but that was, yes, I'm 75% with this or against this a third. Because a lot of the, the issues in that bill, I felt there were some good things in that bill, that, which is the reason I support it and the reason I voted for it. The, my goal with that tr- um, the school transfer bill was to make sure that when the students who are leaving their homes, they're getting on a bus, and we're talking big kids, little kids. My kids are in, will be in fourth and seventh grade. So we're talking all kinds of ages of kids. Get on a bus and drive far away from home to get an education. I want to make sure that when they reach their destination, whether it's Melville School District, Lindbergh School District, wherever it is, that those kids walk into a classroom that isn't overcrowded. They walk into a classroom that has all the books and computers and resources they need and has a great teacher at the front of that classroom to educate those kids. Right now, we don't have a framework in place to make sure that that happens. And so my work on the 2014 bill was to put some of those things in place, like appropriate student-teacher ratios, like making sure the funding was taken care of. There were parts of that bill I didn't like, and that had to do with the vouchers. It had to do with putting private money into public education, and I did not support that part of the bill. But again, Mm -hmm. I was trying to look out for the receiving districts, and I did my very best to try to make that a good bill. Now, let's um, play a clip right now from State Representative Clem Smith, who we had on the podcast in 2014, and he was talking about the part that former Representative England just alluded to, a provision that would have allowed... Uh, children in unaccredited school districts to transfer to non-sectarian private schools? No, I I did not like what uh, the bill turned out to be. Uh, The people in the Normandy School District were led to believe that it was going to be something that actually helped the district. And by the time it got out of conference committee, it was nothing more uh, than a voucher bill. And, And that's what I'll continue to call it, is the voucher bill. So in the 2015 bill, that provision was out. But I was curious about its political dynamics in 2014, because I got the sense that there were some members of the House that wanted it gone, and there were a lot of people in the Senate that wanted it in, and it seems like the Senate side kind of prevailed, which may have caused people to vote against it in the House enough to where it was impossible to override a veto. So did that sort of poison the well of the entire bill and make it impossible to pass the other provisions that may have actually helped the situation? I think that's a fair assessment of of what was going on in 2014. Um, You know, a lot of these deeper public policy questions that affect not just everyone's life, but affect the lives of our children need to really be well thought out. They need to have some time to make sure that everybody's viewpoint's heard. And I think that this sort of, while it could have started that good process with the politics around it, it made it much more difficult for a 2015 bill to be successful. So since you we re-recorded, there was a very powerful This American Life episode on the transfer situation. I'm not sure if you've heard it, and I'm not going to ask you to respond to something you haven't heard. But the impetus was you know, just about the transfer situation and how there are situations where people in underperforming school districts, when they are able to transfer to a better school, it it, make, it transforms their lives. It makes them go from a situation where they're going to be, um, if they were at their current school district, their, their life goes in one direction and not so good direction. And if they're able to go to a different school that's a lot better and has a lot more resources, they are more likely to go to college, their health may be better, uh, their entire life changes. So looking forward, um, is one of the possibilities and one of the goals of fixing this transfer situation to still allow people in un- unaccredited, unaccredited school districts to have that opportunity to go to a better school? And how do you do that without, you know, alienating or making mad the other school districts? Sure, absolutely. I mean, the goal here is to make sure that all children get the best opportunities as possible. So as a mom, as a legislator, as a school board member, I want to educate children, and I want to make sure that they have a good experience. I had several letters from students who had started the transfer process at Melville, had a great experience. Their fear was that they weren't going to be able to continue their education year after year and take advantage of the full high school experience, for example, because they didn't know what the funding mechanism was. And that was another issue that we tried to solve in the 2014 bill, saying if you started your freshman year or any year as a transfer student, that you would have the right to stay there for the entire rest of your your education, regardless of what happened with your home district. And so that's exactly the reason that I keep 
fighting and working on this issue so much is because we want those kids to, to come to us. Yeah. We want to help them, but we need a framework to make sure that it can all work from a financial and uh, social perspective. Yeah, the reason why that's so important, and this was mentioned several times in that piece, is when you have a situation where somebody is going back and forth between a school, and especially going back and forth to Normandy, which is arguably the lowest performing school district, and go, and going to like Francis Howell, which is one of the best, I mean, it really does a lot to the, the child's psychological well, sure, development it's, it's, and just their social lives and their educational development. I mean, it basically tells them that they don't matter because they're just being moved around. And that's not the message that we want to send to any child. Now, of course, you weren't in the General Assembly for this latest uh, version, which is now may come up during veto session because it did pass the, the General Assembly, but the governor vetoed it for other reasons. Do you have any views of the 2015 bill, even though you weren't there when it was crafted, but just your thoughts about, uh, I mean, are, if you were in the General Assembly, would you be voting to override his veto on this? You know, I don't know enough about the bill to be able to make that uh, commitment today, but what I can tell you is that there seems to be a lack of communication between the governor's office and the legislature. Um, that could be due to the fact that we have two separate parties. However, when we work on this again in 16 or moving forward, there needs to be an understanding of what is a signable bill and what isn't. Enough of this, let's just make a statement and say we did did transfer, quote unquote. We need to actually fix the problem. And this is one of my pet peeves that I have about pretty much any piece of legislation going forward. Yes, I get that it's political. Yes, I understand we as Democrats are in the super minority and that anything we really want to do is is not going to happen the way we want it to happen. But we need to start building re those relationships and building to a place where we can at least talk to each other about these issues and take the ones that are not political, like helping kids, and agree on that and move forward. So I'm going to play a clip now from State Representative Marsha Hafner, the aforementioned Oakville Republican, who at one point in time you were running against, but she was we were talking about the transfer bill with her and she actually said that you worked very hard on the 2014 bill was very complimentary of your work i think that she supported the transfer bill in 2014 as well but she mentioned that there is kind of an added time related pressure with this issue that may become uh, i think more urgent if you're re reelected in 2017 this was a bipartisan effort and it's not a bill that solves every problem with what we're looking at now as far as failing districts and receiving districts and future failing districts. Um, St. Louis City Schools are are not looking like they're going to keep their um, accreditation for long again, unfortunately. And that could bring a whole nother world of problems to almost every school district in St. Louis County. What uh, Representative Hafner is talking about is there is a fear among many St. Louis County school districts that if, if the city schools become unaccredited and the transfer law is unchanged, then it's going to cause thousands of children from the city schools to go to county schools. Is it going to take like an, um, you know, essentially an influx of students like that for legislators to finally get serious on this issue? Or do you think that maybe they're for once in the legislature's life? they will be proactive and try to do it before something like that happens. Well, I truly hope that we do something constructive that will help prevent a crisis because that, I think, is why I serve in the legislature, why I run for office is because I feel as though it's the public official's job to take that public trust and say, look, we know there's some bad stuff coming and we're going to do everything we can to pr prepare for it, to prevent it. And that's what I think our jobs are, is to be forward thinking and figure out what that next step is. You know, I, at times the governor has chosen to have a special session. And it seems as though in my history as a legislature, the times that we've actually gotten something done um, have been because of a special session being called. Um, you know, maybe it'll take something like that where we can just come to Jeff City for a few days, be focused on just this issue like we did in the past on other issues, whether it was the Clay Como plant um, or it was Triple Seven Act. Right. The Boeing situation. So maybe that's what we need. Just a time to just focus on this. And, you know, not everyone in the legislature is an ex education expert. You know, we have members of legislature who are small business owners who their forte is small business. We have other people who are involved in other issues. And so by being able to sit down and only focus on this, maybe that's what it'll take because we need to, to fix this. It's you, not something we can just keep the, putting off. Do you think the governor should call that this year, for instance? 
Um, I don't know. This is the last, this, this 2015 year is technically not an election year, and that's typically when we can get some good things accomplished. I think if you wait until 2016, politics starts getting in it even yeah. more so than it already is. And that, I just can't imagine that being able to get a, a bill that the governor would sign in 2016 in September or you know October when the election is kind of in full tilt. It seems like it's this year or you're going to have to wait for the next governor to yeah, do that. Uh, yeah, for 2017. I agree. Now, one of the other issues that's going to be Obviously, you're not going to be there for veto session, although many of the issues that you're aware of are. But one of the the whole deal of the Jeff City atmosphere, which you do know from your years as a state rep, and I'm interested in your take on you know just what's been happening the last few months. We've lost our House Speaker, who's from St. Louis County, over an intern scandal. We lost a prominent uh, Democratic state senator from the western side of the state because of an intern scandal. It's funny. It was so the public so interested in that that when the uh, Senate leader, uh, Tom Dempsey, who's from St. Charles and a Republican, just recently stepped down, which had nothing to do with it. There was all this Twitter track people speculating that maybe it did, even though it didn't, just because they had gotten no. used to all in this. In fact, I think it was the opposite. I think that he had wants to spend more time with his family oh, because yes. he's been in the legislature a long time, and I think he wants to do something else. So. But my point being that, that, that the atmosphere and the public's awareness of the atmosphere was such that if somebody does something that's not connected to it, they assume it has to be because it's so poisonous there now. I'm interested in your take on, is there a misogynist atmosphere? Is there an issue that goes beyond what goes on with uh, uh, interns? Just as a, a woman who has served in Jeff City, I'm interested in your take on all sure, this. Sure, um, absolutely. You know, when we are elected and we go to Jeff City, I feel this burden which means that I feel that the, the public has trusted me because they've picked me to be the person to go to Jeff City and to represent them. And I treat it very much like a job, um, a career, a profession. So I take with me um, the same professional viewpoint that I've always had when I work, whether it was working for St. Louis County or working for the federal government. I take that same level of professionalism with me to Jefferson City. And I think as legislators, we all need to do that. This is a job. This is not a frat house. This is not a place that gives anyone license to do anything other than being professional and working hard for the people of our respective districts. Um, I think if we all remember that we're grownups and that we need to treat everyone that way, I think it would do a lot to improve the culture. Um, you know, just because we're in Jefferson City doesn't mean we're exempt from being professionals. I think that, you know, I think for my concern about this has been twofold. I have wanted to know why the situation is what it is and how to fix it. And it, it seems like when I've been talking with people about this, there are structural things that people talk about, the, you know, availability of alcohol, the free lobbyist gifts, the amount of campaign contributions, um, term limits, structural things. And then there are sort of intangible things, just the people, the types of people who are elected the fact that the people that run for office may be coming with, um, you know, pre-existing character flaws, things like that. And I've asked people their theories on why it is what it is, and but more importantly, just what do you think it's going to, what do you think it's going to take to change the culture, and what do you think needs to be done to make it an acceptable place, not only for female legislators but for young women who are interns or staffers or are lobbyists. Sure. Well, as an elected person and former and future elected person, I really hope I'm not part of that the problem because if we think that people who are uh, immoral or cannot act like grown-ups that we are attracted to Jefferson City in this profession for some reason, that there's something wrong with us, while I'm biased, I, I would disagree with that wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. There are so many people in the legislature, like myself, who – go there because we want to be there, we want to make a difference, and we want to change people's lives. Um, yeah, there's a lot of intangible things, but there are tangible things as well. You know, I could sit here and tell you that, yes, we need to limit lobbyist contributions. We need to put contributions on um, campaign expenditures and campaign contributions overall, because I do agree with those things. Mm -hmm. But that does not give that does not make an excuse for people to yeah. act crazy. And there are other reasons to do that besides this. I right. mean, there's public policy issues related to influence. If somebody is giving you a huge, 
you know, meal or sending you off to a fancy trip, I mean, you may be more indebted to that person to do what they're they're saying. Or by they, I mean the lobbyist representing you. But that has been mentioned a lot as contributing to the atmosphere. So I thought I would mention that again. So at, at this point, do you foresee – now, Claire McCaskill, the senator, has mentioned that she says, well, things just haven't changed from when she was an intern – over 40 years ago, and that it, and that the issue isn't that things have changed badly. It's that they've never changed and that they still are bad. I'm interested. I mean, do people talk that much about it, or is it the fact, I mean, um, has there been much soul-searching? I mean, even though you're not there now from the people that you talk to, I mean, has there been some discussion? Um, you know, I think as a woman, there have been a lot of discussions about, you know, I think one of the differences between 40 years ago and today is that there are a lot more women in the yes. process. And I'm not going to say that women are perfect and men are not because we're all flawed. But, you know, I'll say I think having that many more people aware of what's going on, you know, I wasn't there this last year. So, I, you know, I can't say that I witnessed anything that was happening this past year. But what I can tell you is I am glad that this is at the forefront of discussion because people are now talking about it. They're now saying, look, is this an environment where we want to have impressionable young people who are in college come to the Capitol building and learn? I mean, I was an intern in the White House back in the 90s. I was an intern on Capitol Hill. You know, when I was an intern at that time, my goal was to be there to learn about the system to learn about the people that make up the system and to try to further my career someday. Mm -hmm. um, if I had interned in Jefferson City and had experienced the things that some of our interns have experienced, I, I may not be interested in, in participating in that environment. Now, as an intern in Congress, did you run across any of this kind of behavior? Not, not in D.C. I mean, in D.C., as an intern, say I was an intern in Congressman Gebhardt's office, I was one of a team of probably 10 to 12 interns just in his legislative office. He had other interns when he, that was back in the day when he was the majority leader, right. if we can remember that far back. Yes. Um, so it was, in D.C., it was a different structure. I didn't, it wasn't like Dick and I were hanging out together all the time. It was, you know, a much more removed type of internship. I was Very formal. Right, exactly. And and I think that has to do with the level of government, the stature that he had in the in the Congress at the time. Um, what we're talking about in Jefferson City is when I've had interns, one of whom actually became my legislative assistant, it was me with Adam going to the committee meeting and him taking notes at the meeting while I was chairing the meeting and then us getting together in my office afterwards and saying, okay, what, what report are we going to put together from that meeting that we can then send out the, to the constituents? So it's much more hands-on, every day uh, working together to do what's best for the district. Yeah, The one structural thing that I think would probably make a difference that some people brought up is if I, I this is my theory and maybe I'm crazy on this, but if the percentage of women in the legislature was higher, let's say it was 50-50 or 45-55, I, I, I have to imagine the atmosphere would be different. Or even 60-40. Right I'm or okay 60, with that too. Because right now it's about 25-75 right. on, on, the, on the side of men. Like comparably, I think the board of aldermen in St. Louis is about 40-60. And I've been around the board of aldermen and I've been around uh, Jefferson City and I know that they're different situations, but there's a different atmosphere there. And I think that the gender parity may have something to do with that. I can attest to that because I covered the St. Louis Board of Aldermen in the late 70s when it was when there were just a few women. And, yeah, I think it definitely has made a difference just in the climate. So that might be one of the it would have to be done by the voters. They would have to elect sure. people who are, are women. But do you think that would change the atmosphere well, right there and there? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think one of the things that changes the atmosphere too is being a mother, you know, I would often find myself trying to say, Can't we all just get along? You know, if you guys are mad at each other, come on, let's sit down, let's talk about it and really bring that um, negotiator aspect to it. And so being focused on getting people to know each other from a professional, let's talk about these issues, that being the focus as opposed to other stuff, I think would do wonders. Now, you know, it's one of those things that the voters have to choose, but at the same time, there is also an, a litany of reasons why women don't run for office. Mm -hmm. And if one of them is because Jefferson City has its issues, 
and women aren't treated fairly, that's definitely not going to inspire women to run for office in the first place. A lot to think about as we head into veto session. Well, thank you again for coming in and re-recording what I predicted and what I think was an even better version of the podcast of a very good podcast. Thank you again. Thank you. For all of our stories, go to stlpublicradio.org. You can follow me on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. You can follow Joe on Twitter at... Jay Manis. That's J-M-A-N-N-I-E-S. And you can follow Vicki England on Twitter at... At V England, which is at V-E-N-G-L-U-N-D. We'll be back soon. Until then, so long. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio.